you see, I, I deal a lot with the Shoah. Since my father said that he stayed alive just to be able to tell the story afterwards. So I consider myself as, you know, following his footsteps. Since he uh, established the organization in Israel of the part of a uh, first generation to Holocaust, and I'm continuing that. And since I consider myself as a tree without roots, I don't have any photographs of my ancestors. My father never spoke as, about his family after. He told me some things of his being young and his studies, but never afterwards. But he wrote. And from his writings and from his a story to the project of Steven Spielberg, I learned about him. But then I researched it. I wrote, I got a lot of stuff from the Germans. And I have many certificates from the Germans. And I followed all the footsteps of my father. That's how I know about him. So it's like you you start to discover his history, or he, or he was telling you? He never said anything about the Holocaust. He only said, you know, something. My father was very optimistic. So he didn't want me and my sister to think badly about people. I think that was his philosophy. So he always told us about his good fortunes during the war, like when on the death march in January 1945 from Auschwitz to Großhausen, that he just stepped on a piece of bread, for example. Or when he was working uh, at uh, Buna in Auschwitz, there was one German guy that always gave him some, some sandwich from time to time. So he wrote, since I got a sandwich, I had to survive. I felt that I had to survive because I get, got extra food. So that's what he was telling us about, but nothing about what happened. I just found out from him and from a friend of him by the name of Eliau Zilberberg. He passed away after the a commemoration we made in October 2022. Just three, three weeks later, he passed away, and he told me a lot about my father and the, about the mutual way during the war. So that's how I know. And what, what your father, what was his name? My father's name was Meir Lustmann. He was born in 1924. He, was, he thought he was the oldest son, but I found out that he had a sister that was born in 1920 and passed away in 1922. My father didn't know that. And then he had a brother, Shalom, that was born in 1927. Uh, my grandfather passed away in 1929. He established a Jewish theater in Opatov. Uh, so my father was raised by his mother she was very, she was a Zionist, and she was a seamstress, a very good one. So she could, they really lived okay. And my father went to a Polish school until noontime, and then he went to a Jewish school because his parents from his father's side wanted him to be a rabbi. So he was until, unfortunately, in 1939, that he had to stop studying. He finished like elementary school. And since then, from 8th of September, he was working for the Germans until he was freed in 11 of April, 1945, in Buchenwald. Mm -hmm. what, what do you know more about the life, uh, pre-war life in, in Opatov? My father said, that his life were okay, but 
there was a lot of anti-Semitism. Even if he studied in a Polish school, he said that kids were chasing him and shouting at him all kinds and singing kinds of uh, anti-Semitic songs. His grandfather was a melabed in a cheder, like for the small Jewish kids. And most of the time he spent with his paternal grandfather. And, but I mean, like uh, economically they were living okay, but he, he didn't suffer from anti-Semitism, but it was always there. He, was, he came from a very Zionist family, as I said, and he went to a Chalutz Atzair, which was a really Zionistic movement. But he was too young to immigrate to Israel, but this was his plan always, to come to Palestine at that time. But the war kept him, I mean, taught, caught him too young, and he stayed with his mother and his brother until the end. And then when, you know, he was one of the young guys that stayed at the ghetto to clean the ghetto. So we saw, saw them all waiting, uh, marching to Yashitze, to the train station, 17 kilometers, and he never saw them again. And what, uh, what happened uh, later with, with him? Afterwards? Uh, af after being the... In, in the okay, he was, he was working with the gendarmeria uh, in Nopatov until October 22nd. His boss took him separately to a room and told him that something is going to happen to the Jewish population. And he tried to convince my father to fly, to run away. He said, you're an intelligent boy. You don't have a future here. All the Jews and you too. So you have to escape. My father went to the head of the Judenrat, Mr. Weisblum, told him that. And Mr. Weisblum said, what can I do? But my father said, I'm going to see every one of my neighbors, my relatives, and tell them that. Something is going to happen, you have to choose. Since my father had a license to walk through the curfew, he was going all night long from one to the other to tell them that story. He didn't know when it's going to happen, but it was supposed to be very soon. And he told them to do what they think. Finally, in October 22nd, as we know, at six o'clock in the morning, the whole Jewish community had to step in the marketplace, all of the people, all of the Jewish people. My father's grandmother, Alte, she used to feed him every day. When he finished the Polish school and started the Jewish school, at noon time, she used to give him some warm soup to eat. So she said, I'm not leaving my house. So she was shot in the house. But my father was standing there. He knew that he will be taken because his boss said that he will take care of him. So my father said, when they came to call him, he said, I am not living without my mother and my brother. The guy went to ask his boss, and then he said, it's okay that you'll take your brother, but my, your mother is not going to come with you. She has to go. So my father didn't want to. You know, all his life, he said, why didn't I go with them? 
because he was left alone. And sometimes it was too hard for him, I guess. Now I understand it much better when I'm grown up. But when I was younger, he was saying that. I didn't understand. Anyway, he took, his mother said, it's OK. You just take care of your brother. When you'll be able, you'll come to help me. But they all knew that there is only one way. So my father took his brother, and he asked also an uncle of his. That he said he's a shoemaker, which he wasn't, but he understood that being a shoemaker is good. And the three of them stayed to clean the ghetto. After three weeks, you know, a few of them were taken to the forest and were shot. But my father, with his brother and his uncle, were left and they were sent to Sandomiesh, to the ghetto in Sandomiesh. They were sleeping at the Liceo. Then when they decided to annihilate the Sandomiesh ghetto, they were supposed to be sent to Skarzysko. My father, his brother went to the car with his uncle to the truck, it's not a car, it was a big truck. And my father was supposed to be on the second truck. When they arrived to Skarzysko, he didn't see his brother. He asked what happened. So his uncle said somebody took him down. I didn't know what. And he never saw him again. I just want to mention that, you know, in Yad Vashem, you put, you write down every family or relative that was lost, was killed in the, in the Holocaust. And I found out my father never filled his brother's name. Probably thought somewhere he will be alive. Anyway, my father never talked about his brother. Never. I don't know how he looked like. And since I'm an artist, I try to build a face to my uncle. So I have all kinds of drawings I made. Maybe my uncle look, looked like any of them. But you see, for me, it, I felt, especially in Israel, with all the native Israelis, that I'm really, as I said before, like a tree without roots. That's why I am so trying to build the family tree and to find out about my, my relatives. <laughs> and then from Skarzysko, my father was taken in July 1944 to Auschwitz. He spent six months at Buna Werke. Then from then, he was taken by the death march to Gross Rosen, and from Gross Rosen, you know, in a car, train, he was taken to Buchenwald. And then he was freed by the American army at April 11th, 1945. And since then, that was his birthday. He celebrated his birthday with all his friends that were freed with him. Then was another journey. My father wrote about it. I am free. What shall I do now? I am alone. The only reason I'm here is to tell the story and to go to Palestine. But as a refugee with no identity, with no paper, he tried to steal borders to Switzerland. He couldn't. So they started moving to the American area. They went to Frankfurt. My father established a kibbutz in Frankfurt. And from this kibbutz, thousands of Jews went by illegal ship to Israel. 
And fortunately enough, my father also was the first boat to be kept, to, 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 to be caught by the English people. And he was the first ship to take into Cyprus. So they opened also the Cyprus camps. And in July, in December 1946, they came to Israel with really officially with a certificate. And right away, my father joined the army, the pre-state army. And he served the army until 1971. He was a general at the Israeli army. He was very proud. And then he dealt with Jewish immigrants from Russia. He was the head of the camp in Vienna. To, and he brought about 300,000 Jews from Russia to Israel. That's the story. And so nobody uh, uh, from his family su uh, survived? No. And uh, so uh, I want to ask about Opatuf then. What, what, is, uh, what was uh, 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 Opatuf for him? Did, did he ever uh, visit uh, Opatuf after the war? It is really amazing because he really hated Poland. He never spoke Polish in his life again. And one day in 1983, he comes home and says, I'm going to Poland. It was the 40th anniversary of the Get Warsaw Ghetto Prizel. And it was still communist Poland, but they gave few certificates to civilians, to citizens. And a friend of his said, Mary, do you want to go to come to Poland? Amazingly, my father said, yes, I am going to show them that I'm a free man, that I'm a soldier in the Jewish army, and I can defend myself now. Amazingly, my mother didn't want to go, but I told them, I will take care of you, and I am coming with you. So in 1993, we went to Poland. Sure enough, we went to Opatov. My father went to his paternal family. They had a big kind of townhouse. They had a, a factory for brushes. And the whole family lived together. My father couldn't enter the area. I entered and he stayed outside. The first time I saw my father crying was there. But still he wanted to come. Since then, they came a few times because my mother made a family that helped her righteous among nations. So me as a pharmacist, I helped the wife there to live through cancer with medication I sent her, but it was okay. So he came back. Do you remember also uh, what other places have you, have you been? Yes, we've been all over, you know, in Warsaw we've been like a delegation. So we've been to Warsaw, surely we went to Treblinka and Auschwitz. And in, this was the first, first march in Auschwitz. He found some inmates there. Yes, but he was very happy that he did it, really. It was kind of a closure for him. But at that moment, you, you knew the, uh, the, your father's history when you came in? No. no. It, did, it didn't open him then? Uh, no. You know, in Israel, usually the grandchildren got the, grand, the, I mean the, the grandparents to talk. But since my father got sick very early, we didn't have a chance. So we didn't talk, but my father wrote a lot. And from the writing, I, I found many things. 
that he passed through. And usually I also read a lot of people that, you know, Primo Levi was with him working in Buna. So I think if I read, and I know by heart almost Primo Levi, I think I, I can understand what he went through. Because this is what's interesting to me. What happened to his mind, to his feelings, to his heart? But do you think that he has uh, just like uh, survivor guilt? Sure. Sure. Because it was so hard to be alone. You know, we never celebrated holidays because probably it reminded him of his family. The only holiday we celebrated was Passover with his soldiers in the army camps. This was his extended family. And I told you, really, there were times that he said why I didn't go with them to Treblinka. It was too hard. And I understand now, you see, you, you, you catch me now in a very bad situation in Israel. And there are families that were perished in October 7th. Perished. Whole families. And I see the relatives. And I can't, you know, I have to compare. I compare naturally. And now I understand much more my father. Because we have soldiers now that have also the same guilt. That stay alive and all of their friends were killed. This is really hard situation to deal with. And uh, so, and can you tell me? Uh, I'm sorry. I'm no, that's. <laughs> No, it's okay. <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, it's okay. okay. Uh, Thanks. Because you uh, you mentioned that your father he he was involved in this uh, how it's called the Opatov uh, Association. He was the head for so many years. He was really on anything. He built the most amazing a memorial in, in our country, really amazing, a sculpture made of basilite. No community was doing such a thing, really. Everything was so, with all his heart, and also the score book. He was the editor, and I remember as a child, watching them sitting there night and day and night and taking, you know, all, they asked everybody all over the world to write. And I still have those things, handwritings of people. Most of them were Holocaust survivors. But some of them were people that came before 1939. But it's amazing because the people that came before, they were just asking my father how, was it at the end because they didn't know? And as I told you, my father and really few people knew what happened until the end. And have you, uh, uh, that monument, uh, it's, it's like uh, dedicated especially to Sure, you it's not only that. My, my father asked somebody in Opatov to collect the names of all the people, the Jews that were living in the ghetto in the years until 1942. And all that list is written by a certain Jewish handwriting, like in scrolls. And there is one scroll inside that memorial, and one scroll I have at home. So he really, it is really an amazing memorial, and it is specially to the Jews of Opatov. It's located in Holon Cemetery. Mm -hmm. I think I have a picture here, mm -hmm. a photograph. 
I think I brought. And have you, have you, uh, when you, when you were growing up, uh, have you met also some other friends? Sure, I'm now the head. Yeah. Like after my father, I am the second generation of the opat of Jews. We call it Haopativim in Hebrew. Or there is another a branch of our organization in Toronto. They are called the Aptels. We have also a Facebook uh, site, and we correspond. And as I told you, we made a, a memorial in October. In 2022, for the 80 years, we've been to Opatov. I don't know, you didn't hear about it? No, but I don't hear, you know. I ah, okay, so we made really, that's how the museum caught me, got to me, because uh, I, we made a, like an international delegation. We had people from Canada, from the States, many places, and we made the last way, a few, a, f a kilometer of the last way of our ancestors to Treblinka, to the train station, and we made a memorial in the, like it's the, in the marketplace, we made a plaque on the wall. Mm -hmm. It's a, that about the, the get, ghetto, yeah? It's not about the ghetto, it's about the Umschlagplatz, mm -hmm. the last place where they stood before they were taken. And it's on the uh, market? Yes, somewhere? yes. On the building of the scouts, of the Polish scouts. Mm -hmm. I got the permission and everything, you know, everything is legal. And yes, we inaugurated that time and the lapidarium. Uh, and still I have many plans. Now I'm, my, my next job is to find the mass graves. Because on the way, we know that on the way from Opatov to Yashice, 17 kilometers, Jews were shot and they were buried by the neighbors. So I got already a permit to look for mass graves. We want to mark them. It's very important to us. So can, can you tell more about, uh, I mean, that, that way when you started to be involved in that as active person and who you know, you were cooperating with, and what was the... Okay. Whole, you, know? you know, the problem was, uh, after my father got sick, uh, Eliyahu Zilberberg got his position as the head of the Israeli organization of the Aptels. But Eliyahu was very skeptic about Polish people and their even willingness, willingness to help us. But I said, I believe we can do it because we have to. I was few ta many times in Poland and I, I still, till now I'm amazed of really there were so many Jews living in Poland and nothing, really nothing left. So I said, we have to commemorate somehow and I was so pleased to know that there are young people in Opatov that understand the involvement of the Jewish population in their past in the city. The majority of the population was Jewish. And Jews really was, were a very big part in the economy, in culture, in Opatov. And I just want to because I continue what my father stopped doing, because he was sick. Because as I told you, he really said I survived to tell the story. So I just feel that I have to do that. I don't know if my kids will do it. So I think we have to do it. And I'm so happy that I have some colleagues in Opatov that are willing to help me. Really, I couldn't do it without them. I think for Opatov, it will be very good, I mean, financially, economically, because I understand that many young people live Opatov. And I think that it, it will be very helpful for Opatov to show 
about their Jewish inheritance and to show footsteps of the Jews there because I'm sure Jews all over the world, ancestors, I, I mean, the families of them will come and see. We still have their mikveh and all things that we can do something. So the, lapidar the lapidarium was the first thing to do. Then the plaque that we made on the Umschlagplatz. And then I think with them the same thing that we have to go more, but yes, we have restrictions, but I'm optimistic. I, I won't give up. And so <laughs> what, 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 uh, what ideas do you have? What do you well, want I, think, do? I think the best way, after we find the mass graves and we make also a memorial in Yashitze in the train station, to make a trail, a Jewish trail, to show footsteps of the history of 700 years of Jews in Opatov. There were, you know, the, the Hasidic movement was so strong in Opatov. Avraham Yoshua Heschel, the rabbi from Apta, was one of the establishers of the Hasidic movement. And I'm sure the Jews from all over the world, if something will be visible, they will come by hundreds to see that. Opato was a small shtetl, but big in spirit. And what are other kind of like special places for you in, in Opato, like personally? Personally, no. I know about the, the Mandelbaum family, which is very nice building. My father had a lot of friends there. So, uh, you know, I know the buildings of them where they were living, but not specially for, I mean, it's important to me that the Jewish uh, community will be commemorated and shown that people lived there for so many years. And uh, what kind of uh, events have you participated in in Opatov? Because, for example, I know that there was, of course, the uh, you you mentioned about the op opening of that uh, and that commemorated. Yes, that's the only thing I was uh, mm -hmm. involved in, and uh, I mean, the day after tomorrow, I hope to make a dinner, an Israeli dinner for all our friends as a thank you for all that you're doing for the commemoration of the Jewish community. And, you know, I'm willing to talk. Maybe I will meet some students, talk to them, because I'm talking a lot also in Israel about the Holocaust and about the resurrection also of Israel. I mean, from after the, the Holocaust and how they came to Israel and built a country, which is very important and very, now in Israel it's very important nowadays. And I'm talking about that because, you know, what we are going in the last seven months is really awful. Mm. But in Opatov, yes, we still have a lot of work to do. And uh, do you see that influence of, of that your work on, to, on the local, uh, society on the local uh, citizens? I don't have so many, I, I, I don't have a contact with many of them. I have contact in a few, few of them, so I'm with them. Mm -hmm. But I'm sure because they are, many of them are teachers, it affects their students. And I believe even, you know, in talking to a few, sometimes it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. As we say, the sea is built from small mm -hmm. drops. So I really believe in that and continuous, you know, talking and mentioning and programs and stuff. Yes, I do it in my mother's uh, city. My mother was born in Helm and I'm much more involved there because there is a lot of communication with the local museum there. And I've made a Friday for 1000 people there and I was cooking a Jewish food. I'm not a chef, but I like to. And it was really amazing. 
and they are making Jewish festivals. I wish there would be a Jewish festival in Opatov. Yeah, I think, you know, I mean, someday it's possible. But you know, it, it, as I understand, it's quite difficult nowadays with the municipality, but I hope that's why I want to come and maybe, you know, I don't know even, I think it's very reasonable to help doing something that will be, it's a win-win situation also for the city. If you can do something that brings tourists, it can flourish the city. Yeah, yeah. So I think also because it's, you know, it's, it's about the identity of the place that it's more rich. You see that in culture, that, sure. In that, in, 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 in that, uh, you know, my grandfather established a Jewish theater in Opatov. Nobody knows about it. I just wrote to somebody that researched it and he said, yes, Avram Perlmutter, which was my paternal grandfather, was establishing, yes, in 1920. And Nobody uh, knows about that. And there is a, a building of that theater? I don't think it's a building. Probably it was something, you know, uh, he was 20 when he established the theater. Like summer. And he passed away in 1929. Mm -hmm. But I'm still, I'm looking for his grave. Probably was buried in work. So I still have a work to do. And I'm still waiting to see maybe I can find a picture of my uncle in some schools in Opatov, I don't know. But, uh, because uh, I want to ask about the other uh, descendants of the Jews from Opatov. So who, who is, uh, for example, who, there are some other people that would come today to the vernissage? No, the to the vernissage, no, because you see the situation, they wanted to come, but I have to organize and I couldn't organize. I was preoccupied because we had a really disaster in my family, a soldier was killed. And I couldn't, I didn't, I didn't know a week, last, last week I only knew that I'm coming. So we couldn't do it, but I'm sure we'll arrange something and we'll come also to the exhibition. And they want to come again to a part of, yes, we didn't, have a lot of time to spend in Opatov. So maybe in a few months ahead we'll do it. But I'm connected to all the, really all the second generation all over the world. The actors, I told you in the in, uh, United States, in Canada, and in, sure in Israel. And you know, I keep them posted everything and I got also wishes for good luck for today. And they are really anticipated to see pictures and photographs. Mm -hmm. And they are very happy that Opatov is on the map. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, you, uh, how I understand, you, uh, can you tell more about yourself? Uh, what, Myself? Yeah, what is your, I don't know. Okay. I, I, I was life? born in Israel in 1950. Uh, I'm the oldest daughter, and you know, for Holocaust survivors, I'm named after my paternal grandmother. Uh, and all my life, I've been like in two positions. I said in false identity. One of them was keeping my parents, you know, to be okay. And from the other side, I wanted to be an Israeli. Because all my friends, all surrounding, I was born to a, in, in a military camp. And most of my life, I've been living in a military environment. And most of them were Israelis that were born. And they had grandmothers and grandfathers. And I didn't have anything. So I was really in between. Uh, anyway, uh, I went to study pharmacy because my father said, you need an international profession in order somebody will kick you out and you have to wander around the world. So have an international profession. So I studied uh, pharmacy. 
I have a few degrees in pharmaceutical sciences. And after about 30 some years, I went to study art. So I have also a degree in art, sculptures. And all my art is based on being a refugee. Up to today, I, I really understand the refugees now and I feel like a refugee by myself and I deal with that all the time for many years. So can you tell more about uh, your, uh, your art, what kind of... Yes, my, my, my first what? project was in false identity, second generation because my, father, my mother survived the war in false identity. And then I thought I was also living in a false identity because I wanted to be an Israeli like Sabre, like the cactus Israeli, but I still have some origin in Europe. Uh, so all my sculptures really deal with the question of no land, yes land, wandering, the wandering Jew, how, you can manage packaging all your life in one rucksack. And my works are dealing with that. I have like rucksack that look like houses. Houses look, I make all kinds of sheep, all kinds of really wandering people. And I so identify with people today also that have to leave their houses looking for somewhere else to live a normal life. So this is my DNA, really. Mm. And what kind of material do you use? It usually, uh, there is no limit to the materials I work. It, it is a project-oriented work, usually. So I work with wood, I work with ceramic, I work with wires, I work with a felt, felting. I have sculpture three meters high from felt. Uh, all kinds of stuff. It depends on the object I want to to do, to make. So you feel, you, you, you said about that dilemma of being Sabra, of being European, Ashkenazi, Juhai. Right, and, right. And what about your parents? Like both uh, Holocaust survivors, uh, survivors in Israel, your father in army, uh, but do you think that they... Uh, what, what was, in, in your opinion, the position of Holocaust survivors in, in Israel when you were going I can out? tell you exactly. In the 60s, it was awful. Because, I don't know if you know, but Ben Gurion wanted to create a new Jew. Like an Israeli Jew. No exile. Because in the exile, Jews were looked upon as weak, and he wanted to have a new model of Israelis. So first of all, he said he didn't like people to talk Yiddish, for example, Jewish. And it was awful until 1961, the Eichmann trial, which made all the difference in the world. It was very smart of Mr. Hausner to give a mouse to every Jew Holocaust survivor, all kinds of them, from the ghetto, from the partisans. And then people understood that it was real. Then people started to talk about it, to get a legitimacy. But since then, it was really awful. There was no place for... There were no place for their pain. They had to shout, to shut their mouth. And since then, people were softer and understood. And of course, now we cherish every survivor that is still alive. But it's too late for many of them. Do you think your parents suffered from that? It was a, 
uh, also maybe, I mean, no, it's not like My father said, you know, we didn't ask, my father wrote it. You didn't ask and I was happy not to talk. I was so involved in my work at the army and then with the, with, with the immigrants, so I didn't have time and probably didn't want to. They shut their mind of that. My mother didn't stop talking. My mother talked all the time about the Holocaust. My mother was free. She talked and talked and my kids know everything. Really, her grandchildren, she was talking nonstop. And she was going to schools and she was talking. My father didn't talk because it was, I think, very bad for him. So he wrote, it's okay, he wrote and he talked to Mr. Spielberg. And uh, so he wrote to uh, the Iskor book, yeah? He Not only it's Iskor book, I don't know if they, they here in your museum, I sent a lot of his material, it's, on, it's online also in Yad Vashem, I, I donated everything to Yad Vashem mm -hmm. and it's now on air, it's visible to anybody. And I think here, I don't know what about the exhibition, but they told me that they are going to translate his writing from Yiddish to Polish. Mm -hmm. So I don't know about that, but probably it's somewhere. And you said that you have this, uh, uh, also uh, like manuscripts of other testimonies. Of yes. Other for that. Uh, uh, testimonies. For, 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 for from the Holocaust. For the sef sefer, uh, yes, but. Not everything is in the, in the Sefer, so I have, yes, I have at home, and I called their kids and gave it to them, many of them. Mm -hmm. They were amazed, they didn't know that even. Yeah. You know, it's, I just come from the Emanuel Ringenblum Memorial, and I think how great historian, he was thinking about keeping those details about uh, what happened in the ghetto. So you see every piece of, of uh, information we have is very important. And my father used to say, I'm going to say a very hard thing, but he said, when I'm dead, please, take off my skin with the number I have from Auschwitz because the history will deny there was an Holocaust ever. And I know it's feasible because even October 7th they say didn't exist. So it's really frightening. You have to keep all the information and let people know what happened. I want to ask about your mom. Uh, uh, did uh, some other members of her family survive? Yes. And what, can you, can you tell, tell I, I, I know that it's a long story. Pro it's okay, I would like to talk, you, no problem. Uh, so if you can, can, can tell what was his sto story of survival? Her, my mother, a, as I said, was born in 1925 in Cheum. She, there were five kids and she was the third. Two of uh, her older brothers, Yaakov and Eliezer, fled to Russia during the occupation of the Russians, you know, in the beginning of the war. And uh, my grandfather paid some money to an officer and he took them to Russia. They spent, uh, they, you know, they uh, came up to Uzbekistan and stuff, but they s stayed alive. And my mother stayed with her sister, Malka, which was young and in a year, and with her brother, Yechiel. He was eight years old with the parents. And in the ghetto, she managed to earn some money. She was really a tough person. And she made all kinds of works which are, it's, you know, I can talk about it, but it is really, she was really amazing until the end. Her mother was killed in the first action in May 1942. Somebody on the street shot her. My mother saw it. 
and it was such a tragedy. It was in Shavuot time, and we never celebrated Shavuot in my life because always there was a candle and they shot my mother 70 years later. And at the end, the end was in October 42. My mother stayed alone after helping her father and the two kids. But then she stayed alone. She stayed, somebody, she, she was looking like Aryan, like I mean non-Jewish. So some, somebody offered her a job and Sure enough, they accepted her and she was sleeping there. And that's how she made them righteous among nations, the Fikes family. Finally, she felt that she's harming them and they, you know, they are in a very big danger. So she made a plan to run to Lublin. She had a cousin that converted in 1936 to Christianity and maybe she could help her. But when she entered, they had a Tsukernia uh, in Lublin, uh, she met, the husband even didn't know my mother, his name was Joseph Dennis, and she said, I'm the cousin of your wife, you don't know me, but I want to live, please help me. And he said, I can't help you because the Gestapo are coming every half an hour to search for my wife, you know, three generations before. She is Jewish, and I hid her. We had a, we have a child already, a daughter, and but I will somehow bring you to a worker of mine in the store. Maybe she can help you. Anyway, my mother <laughs> volunteered to be a forced laborer, a Polish for without any paper. Her name was Zofia Wisniewska. A girl that passed away in Helm, and she, she knew about it. And finally, she finished as a worker, compulsory worker in Hamburg. She was taken to the Gestapo because somebody thought she was Jewish, but she, she managed to stand up. And she was freed in May 1945 in Hamburg. And then she found out that her sister survived, her father and uh, her younger brother were taken to Sobibor. And what is uh, your mother's name? She was born Tauba Schulklapper. So she has many names, that's why I say false identity. Zofia, Zosha, Tola, everything. <laughs> It's okay. So she was from Tauba Shulklapper to Zofia Vishnevska, and then she passed away, Yona Lutan. Jews have many names. No, 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 of course. <laughs> so, yeah, I was. Uh uh, just, uh, um, I was just wondering, you know, as you, you, you asked a second generation, how you would say, uh, you know, uh, because wh when you said that, uh, I was asking you and you said that until the Eichmann uh, trial, there was no space for... Uh, for Survivors. And, and I think that also you know, that there was a, uh, it's also, uh, uh, was obstruction for them to go through, through that experience somehow to, you know, from the, like, ther uh, therapical point of view, psychological, emotional, to go <laughs> You know, in that time, there were no psychologies no, yeah, yeah. and nothing. Yeah. I think that the Holocaust made them very tough because they had really to shut their emotions, otherwise they couldn't survive, especially in the camps. And I read a lot about it. You, you, you really can't. 
but so they were part of them was dead really I never heard my mother never said she loved me I knew she loved me but she never said it because I think it was too painful for the, her and maybe she thought maybe she will lose me too I don't know but all my friends are like that we are a whole generation you know, I didn't know that until I joined a, a group of second generation kids to Holocaust survivors. And as if we were born in the same houses, no hugs, no I love you. And our parents were really dedicated to us. They gave us everything, but still their emotions were shut. That's the price you have to pay to survive, I guess. So you also start to understand your, you said your parents realized some, uh, I mean, the reasons why they... They were closed, yes. Yes, understand, you know, I'm, a, a, first of all, I read a lot. Since I wanted really to, you can never understand until you are in the situation, sure. But I wanted to, to feel, to try to feel what, what they were thinking about, how they survived. Because it is really such an awful situation. So I read a lot of Primo Levi and other philosophers that survived the war. They had some, you know, they managed to, to tell better the, the emotional situation they were in. You know, Primo Levi said, one day I went outside and I saw that the sun was going down as if the world is still going around. Because some people said like Katsetnik, that was another planet. But then after he was treated, he said, no, it wasn't another planet. It was the same planet, but really bad human beings. So I try to understand that now that I'm older and I have grandchildren, sure, I understand much more what they went through. And I very feel pity for them, and I feel pity that I didn't understand when I was young. I knew that I had to be the best, because that's what my parents told me. You have to be the best, like I was the best with the Germans, so nobody had any argument with me, and I was okay, and that's how I survived. So you have to be the best. That's what I knew. But I didn't, you know, they didn't talk and we didn't ask because we were afraid to ask, I think. And now it's too late. And what's in that context? Uh, what kind of meaning has the, uh, your trips to Poland or to Apatu? Does it help you somehow or is First it of more difficult? It is very difficult for me, always. All Poland is difficult for me. All Poland, you see, today I was sitting in front of the museum. In the morning I went through, and I saw so many people going to the museum. And I said, I wish it didn't exist and everybody was living. On one side, I'm happy that people are coming to see the museum. Really, I see all kinds of people and it makes me happy. <laughs> but inside, I say, why should it be like that? I lost all my family. I don't know anything. It's not my family. It's the heritage that kills me. The heritage. So many wise people, so so much culture was just disappeared. Cultura o Salona, you say? Yeah. If you survive something? Yes. Mm -hmm. Nothing was left, really. And if you would uh, have, I don't know, uh, this kind of opportunity to say, let's say, people from Opatu, I mean, why, what you feel, why you are coming to Opatu, what you, or what you would like to them to understand 
what, what you would say? I, you know, I was thinking, you see, Opatov was about 70% Jewish. And I think September 1st, 1939, 70% of your friends from school didn't come to school. You were not wondering what happened? This is the question that always, you know, digging my mind. As if we didn't exist at all. And it makes me crazy to see. And also here, you know, I was wondering here in all the neighborhoods, Zamenhof Street, Edelman Street, Anilevich Street, it was all Jewish. Only the names exist, nothing exists. So I, I asked people from Opatov just to understand that we were a very meaningful part of the, their heritage. Just don't neglect it. Try to, to learn something from it. I don't think they were bad people. They enriched the whole neighborhood. So I just want them to, to understand and to see our part. And yes, to help us commemorate that heritage, which is a part of them too. Yes, you know, uh, I think we, 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 we met doing a lot of interviews, that kind of interviews. We met, for example, local, even now, like this kind of local, Polish activists, and, and, but the thing is that I think the people that, uh, you know, when, when you said about Opatov, there's, it was 70% of the Jewish population, and now if there are some people that will realize what it means, they start to understand that they live in, the, in a place when the majority of inhabitants, the majority of culture just disappeared. Right. And that I think that, uh, I, this is what I asked them, even, uh, you know, I asked them, so how, how you deal with that? Because, you know, when they would discover the Jewish, uh, you know, the history of the place, it means that they have to face, uh, uh, I would say somehow, trauma, that they are living on a place, that they, it is a place of mass murders and so on, and, and when there is this, when, when the majority of culture, you know, majority uh, just disappeared, and how they deal with that? This is, this is the question, because how you can live on such a place, you know? You know, every place with a trauma has to live with that, and you have to, to overcome it. I mean, it's not their fault. Even my father came to Poland, and he was talking, you know, and he was staying in Vienna, in Germany, and he was working with young people. It's not their fault. They didn't do anything for it, their ancestors maybe, but not them. So just help maybe to, to dig or to s somehow to show the, the, the culture that was then. But it's not your fault. I don't blame the young people. It's not their fault. But you just have to agree to mention that there were many people living here before. Like, you know, like archaeologists. <laughs> That's the... Yeah, but I, I mean that it's not also that if, if you realize as a local... Uh, that yes, I understand what you that, say. That, that's a huge emotional burden. Then sure. You to realize, this is how you say about Muran. Okay. When you start to realize there was a Jewish district here and there is nothing left. Right. At all. Zero. Nothing was here. Nothing is, was left after the war, yeah? And, you know, what? when you start to realize that it's, uh, for, for example, me personally, I would not, uh, we, we were yesterday talking about that, that I, uh, I, I, I would not like to live in the district. Really? No. no but it's me. not your fault, you see, yeah, I, I... I know, but it, it's a place with where it was, it's, it's a, about the place of catastrophe. It's like ground zero. Uh, yes, I understand. And in Poland, every place 
Yes, we say, you know, we say that Poland is soaked with Jewish blood. That's, that's what we talk about. So, but, you have to do something about it. What happened, happened. But we have at least not to, to be negligent. Negli just neg for that. Mm -hmm. you don't, we don't have to neglect it. Mm -hmm. We have to accept it and try to do something to restore. That's what I think. You always live on some layers beneath. Always. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Always. Yeah. But you have to accept this is really the biggest tragedy. I think mankind really had to suffer. Unfortunately, it was my parents. But we have to learn from it and to try, you know, to really build, really. You know, in, in uh, Helm, they asked people to bring some stuff that was hidden in, you know, everybody lives in Jewish homes. Very few brought back stuff. I don't want it. I just want to show that some Jews were living here. <laughs>